We truly have something that is the envy of the rest of the world. I've had the opportunity to travel some and talk with folks. We have a lot of people who come visit the Northwest to come see the hydropower system and how it works here. And the fact of the matter is we have something that is really unique and it's something that is a public power system so it means it's owned by all of you. And one of my worries actually is whether there is a, an understanding uh, of those who are receiving the benefits of the system of just how incredibly valuable it is and that in fact it is yours and you will decide its future. So the purpose of today's talk is just to kind of talk through a little bit about the history of how the system evolved, where it is, what it is that it does for you, and what its future is. This Columbia River is a huge river, the fourth largest river in North America, and it sits on the side of an incredibly steep hill. And the story I like to tell just to give people a sense of this is, think for just a moment, if you had a drop of water that came down on the east side of the Rockies and it was to flow generally down the Missouri and then down the Mississippi, to the Gulf of Mexico and how long that would take versus if it fell one inch to the west and came down the Columbia River system and went to the Pacific Ocean. So just put that vision in your mind for a second. The difference in terms of river miles is, is roughly a factor of four. Now sea level is the same everywhere, we all know that, and so if you're traveling from the same height to the same sea level, then imagine if you're traveling that in one fourth the distance how much steeper the hill must be. That's, the, that's what creates the incredible opportunity to, to produce hydropower here. Big river, side of a, an incredibly steep hill. Folks have known this for a long time. Lewis and Clark got here. These were folks who knew big rivers. They had come up the Mississippi and up the Missouri, and they came across the Rockies and they got to the Columbia and they said, my gosh, there was a great roaring sound, something like we had never heard before, and it was the power of the Columbia and that power of the Columbia of course was known to the Native Americans who lived here as well and that power was something that was more than just the energy in the system it's a power that actually brings people together in the Northwest it started with the Native Americans with Salilo Falls and Kettle Falls and the other places that were the great markets in effect the places where people came together to trade goods and I would argue it continues to be the thing that brings us together in the Northwest it's something that truly unites us so people came post Lewis and Clark they came by Conestoga Wagon, they came by Model T, they came by Model A, they came in a variety of different ways. But candidly, when they got here, they did not find a great deal of wealth and bounty. Uh, this was a community that was really quite poor, uh, especially through the 1920s. And the, they could see that there was opportunity. They could, they could see that there was tremendous opportunity in the Columbia River, but they couldn't figure out really how to capture that and translate it. So they tried a variety of different ways, and, and uh, they even talked about, uh, gosh, I, here I am, I'm 50 feet away from this incredible river, but I could be 500 miles away because I can't pull the bounty of that river up into my farm and into my community. It took some vision in order to be able to figure out what to, to do with that river, and that vision was there. And when, when we think about this, and I will tell you in my job, I've often thought about this in terms of what it took to be able to develop this incredible hydropower system here. A guy by the name of Rufus Woods is a uh, publisher of a really small town newspaper, the Wenatchee World, and he starts talking about the fact that, you know, if we could just build dams across this river, and not just the little dams, there was discussion of building relatively small dams on the Columbia in the 20s. He said, we shouldn't build small dams, we should, we should think big here. How many of you know what the word coulee actually means? A big ditch, a big ravine uh, formed by glaciers. Um, and he, he looked around and he said, you know, there's a really big coulee upstream from Wenatchee a little ways here. Such a big coulee that it could be described as a grand coulee. And in fact, he said, you know, we have the opportunity to be able to build a dam at this end of this Grand Coulee. And if we can build a dam there, we would we'd have tremendous opportunity to produce electric power. But not only that, tremendous opportunity to develop the agricultural community in this area in a, pa in a way that had never happened before. Never happened before by probably a factor of 10. Imagine how big that vision was. And he kept talking about it and kept talking about it, but he needed someone to help him along because, again, he didn't have the money to make this happen. And along came Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt spoke to the vision and he said, you know what, uh, we need to find ways to use the public waterways for a public good. And I want you to keep that phrase in mind because using the public waterways for a public good is really what has uh, been the underlying element, the foundation of this system for close to 75 years now. 
And he said, we need to be able to, to use it for navigation, for irrigation, for recreation, for flood control, for power production. And we need to think about it in terms of where it will create the greatest good for the community of the Northwest. And he spoke to that. He spoke to it in, in 1934 and in 1937. The natural hydroelectric power resources belonging to the people of the United States or the several states shall remain forever in their possession. In the construction of this dam, we have had our eyes on the future of the nation. Its cost will be returned to the people of the United States many, many times over in the improvement of navigation and transportation, the cheapening of electric power, and the distribution of that power to hundreds of small communities within a great radius. So he laid out the vision and he was, of course, elected president, and uh, although he was not able to create the Bonneville Power Administration in the first 100 days, he was able to create the Tennessee Valley Authority. He got the funding for Bonneville Dam and Grand Coulee Dam, uh, and by 1937, actually, the dam was just about complete, and they thought, well, gosh, we're going to have to wait to distribute that electric power, and so they created the Bonneville Project Act for a temporary agency, the Bonneville Power Administration, to be able to distribute the power from those projects. Now, there was an important thing that was said there. You might have caught it when he spoke to the fact that the, the benefits of the system for, should be for the people of the United States and the several states. Now, that's an unusual phrase for a president or a president-elect to use. And what he meant by that was he was talking about the fact that the Columbia is an indigenous resource and the value of that indigenous resource should be dedicated to the people of the Northwest, to the people of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, up to the Continental Divide. And if you read our statutes, that's actually the way they are written. They describe that the value of the system is dedicated to you. When you choose to live in the Northwest, you've got this great legacy that came to you by statute that says the value of the system is dedicated to you and to provide benefit for this community and this region. And so people came to build these projects. These were huge projects on a magnitude and scale that had never been seen before. Uh, and it was built around this concept, again, of public service. In fact, as the, the transmission lines were built, we'd get to communities, Bonneville would get to communities, and then someone would have to build the distribution systems. And of course, that led to your local public utility districts, just like Benton and Franklin, and the utilities that serve this community. And this was real community service. This was people getting together and going out and building distribution lines to be able to move the power from that high voltage transmission system to their farms, to their homes. And these were huge projects. And uh, I've had the opportunity to read some of the diaries of the folks who came to work in these projects. And this was, uh, of course, it was the time of the Depression. People needed work. People came from all over. But this was more than just work. But people knew that they were doing something that was going to make a difference in people's lives. These were huge opportunities to be able to do something that was create a lasting legacy. And they recognized that. And you can see just from us, these pictures just how big these projects were. And I would say in a time before OSHA, looking at these pictures. <laughs> a little bit different time, but recognize that folks knew they were doing something that was going to make a real difference and has made a real difference for the Northwest. And they completed Grand Coulee, the largest concrete structure in the world at the time it was built, and even today, the largest generating plant in North America. And if you haven't been to Grand Coulee, I'd urge you to go visit it just to take a look, because remember, it's your asset. It's your opportunity to go up and see what an incredible thing humans could, could put together to benefit all of you. There was some con controversy about this at the time. Uh, the, a guy by the name of Woody Guthrie was hired by Bonneville to write some songs. Some of them you may have heard. Green Douglas fir where the waters cut through. Down our wild mountains and canyons it flew. Canadian Northwest to the ocean so blue. Let's roll on, Columbia, roll on. So Roll On Columbia was an anthem for many folks who live in the Northwest. I know there's a lot of folks who work at Bonneville who say they grew up singing the song in their fifth grade classes. Um, when he was hired in 1941, that was because e even at the time that uh, Bonneville and Grand Coulee were being built, and we look back at it now and we say, of course, those were 
incredible things, and they were really smart things to do. But there was tremendous controversy about building Bonneville and Grand Coulee. There's a there's a famous quote that appears over and over, including in the 1939 Reader's Digest, that says there is no one out here to sell power to except the jackrabbits and the coyotes. Why in the world would you want to build big projects like that? Um, there's not very many people that live out there to begin with, and they're mostly poor anyway. They won't be able to afford this. Um, it seems like really a dumb idea to put together a big project like that. And there was controversy about it until probably around December 7th, 1941. Um, and the war started. And we had this uh, huge opportunity to be able to take advantage of the power off of the system to be able to contribute to the war effort. Uh, 40,000 planes that flew in the Allied fleet uh, in, the, in World War II came from aluminum produced from the Federal Hydropower Projects. One quarter of the naval fleet that sailed in World War II was produced with power from the Federal Columbia River Power System. And of course the Manhattan Project made a huge contribution to ending the war. After the war, Harry Truman said, you know, if it hadn't been for Bonneville and Grand Coulee, it might well have been that we would not have won World War II. So, so the war ends and people look around and say, you know what, now we're realizing that this maybe was a good investment and we should continue to build it out. And so other projects were built, uh, the Dalles, John Day, McNary, and the Lower River, the four Lower Snake projects completed in the 1970s. Uh, Libby Dam completed as a result of the Columbia River Treaty with the Canadians because, interestingly enough, this is a river that doesn't respect the 49th parallel and some parts of it start in Canada, come down in the United States, and then go back up into Canada before coming back down into the United States. Uh, Dwarshack and uh, other facilities that uh, provided some, some storage capability that's out there. So the system grew a lot from 1940s to the 1970s. And in the midst of that, there was also a recognition that there was the opportunity to work on an international basis because this is an international river. And so a, uh, a treaty was signed with the, uh, with the Canadians, the Columbia River Treaty, and that led to the development of hydropower projects in Canada, um, huge development of those projects. And then as a result of that, because there was so much more power that was available, there was a recognition that we in the West Coast could work in a symbiotic way and build a transmission system that would connect British Columbia to the Northwest and to California. First time large high voltage transmission had been built in this fashion any place in the world. Uh, and it has produced billions, and I mean that billions with a B, of dollars of benefits for ratepayers in British Columbia, in the Northwest, and in California. And a network transmission system was built as well that connected up all of these projects so you could make sure that you could get power to your homes. In the early days, they used mules. Today, we actually have the opportunity to use a little bit more high tech. Uh, helicopters are being used now. Some of you may have seen that there was a major new transmission line that was constructed just a few miles down to the, uh, the west of here. The John Day to McNary transmission line was completed this February. Completed with funds actually from the economic stimulus bill from uh, 2009. 150 miles of transmission uh, completed for uh, about $200 million, about $150 million under budget, I'm happy to say, and ahead of schedule. Uh, a project that uh, will continue to provide cost-based power, not-for-profit power, to you and to, uh, to your community and to communities across the Northwest. And there's a cadre of folks, public servants, who are committed to serving you, just as they were in uh, 1937 and beyond. People who are here on the basis of this being a not-for-profit utility and being here for the purpose of using the public waterways for public good. And what do we get out of this system? So we have a cost of electric generation from the federal hydropower system that averages somewhere between $10 to $15 a megawatt hour. Let me just put that in context for a second. So if you were looking at a new uh, gas-fired plant, even with low natural gas prices today, you're probably talking $50 or $60 a megawatt hour. If you're talking a wind unit, it's probably $90. Solar units that are being built in Southern California, they're pretty proud of the fact they've been able to get the prices down to $150 a megawatt hour. This is an incredibly inexpensive system. And as a result of that, we have some of the lowest electric rates in the country. Montana, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, well below the national average and substantially below our neighbors to the south in California. And it does create a competitive advantage for this region. But it's not just an economic advantage, it's an environmental advantage as well. If this hydropower system had not been built, we would have roughly 15 more coal plants operating in this region than we have today. 
So think about that for a second. There are basically two coal plants in this region, both of which are, there's now substantial discussion about terminating their operation. Imagine how difficult that conversation would be if there were 15 more coal plants providing the power that kept the lights on here. And since there are uh, not 15 coal plants, we have much cleaner air. So we don't have the sulfur dioxide, the nitrous oxides, the mercury emissions that other parts of the country are now dealing with, and we don't have the issues that they are confronted with over the next 10 to 20 years in terms of dealing with that fleet. And of course, the most significant environmental issue of our time would be climate change and CO2 emissions are a big part of the discussion there. The electric power sector and the transportation sectors in this country each emit about one third of the CO2 emissions in the country. And so it gets a lot of attention. We start with a huge natural advantage here because in terms of CO2 emissions from the entire electric power system of the Northwest, we're at about one third the national average, substantially below the industrial mid Midwest. And from the federal system, which is the hydropower system and Columbia Generating Station, the nuclear plant just up the road here, zero carbon emissions, the largest zero carbon emissions electric utility in the world. So this is more than just the value of the electric power, though. It's also power, go back to Roosevelt's speech, power in, or value in terms of flood control. Uh, 1996, the river would have been about two feet higher if it wasn't for flood control. Cities of Portland and Vancouver would have been substantially underwater. Just last year, 149 million acre feet of water came down the, the river, about the fifth highest in recorded history. It would have been substantial flooding in that area, including and the Tri-Cities as well. And it's a system that has creates incredible navigation benefits. The top U.S. and wheat barley export gateways in the world here. Uh, the uh, $20 billion worth of cargo last year supporting 40,000 jobs. And as that cargo moves, if it were to move by rail or by truck, it would emit four times the amount of emissions that it does by moving by, nav by, by barge. Incredible irrigation system, almost 3 million acres that are irrigated in the Columbia Basin from uh, water from the uh, from the Columbia Federal Hydropower System, as well as over $2 billion of annual crop value. Okay, so we've had some incredibly good things here. Countless people were emancipated from the grip of poverty. Freedom was secured for millions. Lives were saved. Our quality of life has been enhanced, and our air is the cleanest in the nation, all as a result of the development of this hydropower system. What could possibly tug at our conscience in the shadow of those accomplishments? We do have one significant issue we have to deal with, the environmental consequence associated with the federal hydropower projects or impacts on fish and wildlife. It was a sad experience for some when the gates at the Dalles Dam were dropped on a Sunday morning in March 1957, and the fishing sites and fast water of the river were inundated by the rising pool behind that project. Near sunset that day, the Indians, with their long braids and black, wide-brimmed hats, solemnly watched their ancient fishing grounds at Salila Falls slowly disappear under the water. A great and historic site on the Columbia had vanished. And that clip captures a couple of the really key issues that have been struggles for us for the last 20 years. First, how do we address the fact that the hydropower system does have a huge impact on particularly anadromous fish, salmon and steelhead, but also the impact on the Native American community? Because in general, while the bounty has been shared across this region, the Native American communities have not shared in that bounty. And so we've been working on that. Um, and you heard a little bit earlier that in 2008, we signed some agreements, the Columbia Basin Fish Accords, that uh, committed nearly a billion dollars towards fish and wildlife restoration over the course of the next 10 years. Uh, and more than that, I think, was the, that we found some common ground with the Native American tribes. Uh, Ron Suppa, who's the chairman of the Warm Spring tribes, I think said it best. We came in as adversaries and litigators, and we came up with a new partnership and a different vision. And we are now working together in a partnership in a way that we have not historically. And I'm here to report to you today that we're making some progress in that regard, too. So we are seeing a halting and a reversing of the decline of Columbia Basin salmon in, in this region. We're seeing more fish coming back past Bonneville Dam than at any time since the dam, dam was put in place in 1937 by roughly a factor of two over the course of this last decade. The investments that we're making are providing a return. 
So there are investments in terms of moving adults upstream through ladders. But the critical ones are moving juveniles downstream. It turns out it's really hard to get those little critters to the dam and then past the concrete structure. Uh, nearly a billion dollars of investment in the last decade in terms of finding ways to be able to move juveniles past the concrete structures, and we are now seeing survivals that exceed 96 percent. Catch that for a moment. 96 percent juvenile survival past each of the dams, substantially better than it was just a decade ago. Investments in tributary restoration and, and investments in new hatcheries. And I will tell you that in this day when it's tough to find new money from the federal fisc, th these are dollars that are available because there is a hydropower system, a hydropower system that does sell electric power and does produce revenue. And if it weren't for this, these kinds of investments would not have been possible. This is a clip of uh, sockeye. You may have heard about the famous Lonesome Larry, the fish that, the, the, the last sockeye, the one fish that came back in the mid-1990s to Redfish Lake up in Idaho, a 900-mile journey, the furthest that salmon swim in fresh water any place in the world. Uh, we now, uh, in the last three years, have seen more than 1,000 fish per year come back. So it is no longer Lonesome Larry. His progeny have actually, uh, are, are proliferating. So the river today, and where are we going from here? It does, it shapes our lives today. It's, it's not just something that was a, an historical artifact. It powers the internet, it uh, feeds our families, it supports our jobs. It's an incredible piece of your life if you live in the Northwest. And it's gonna be an incredible part of the future, I believe. So when we think about where we're going with our future, there is hardly anyone who has a vision of moving forward without electricity being the cornerstone of that vision. We talk about it in terms of electric cars. We talk about it in, in terms of whether they're uh, new load server farms. We talk about it in terms of any kind of uh, new, age, or new uh, industry coming to this area is generally coming here largely because they have the availability of clean and low cost and reliable electric power. These are just some of the industries have moved to this region that have produced significant new loads and new jobs in the course of just the last five years. And this river system produces revenue, and that revenue has been available to support the largest energy efficiency program anywhere in the world. So remember that we start with a clean, low-cost, reliable system, and because we have these significant investments in energy efficiency, we are maintaining that low-cost, reliable, and clean system. And we have one of the largest wind power development going on in any place in the world here as well. And that is not an accident that that's happening. It's happening here in large part because you had a very big transmission system sitting next to a very big storage battery. Because we all know that when the wind blows is not coincident with when you choose to flick on the lights. We have to have an ability to produce electricity on demand. And what wind does is it produces energy, but you have to be able to have something that can then move when you flick the switch. And when you flick the switch today, it's not controlling the wind power, it's controlling the hydro turbines. The hydro turbines create the storage to be able to make all this wind power produce reliable electricity for this region. On top of that, electric power is, I would argue, harder than rocket science. Um, it's an incredibly intense and very difficult industry uh, in terms of its complexity. And it, it, and it's an amazing industry. Think for a second that loads and resources have to balance in real time every second. So when you flick the switch, a generator has to move in response to that within a nanosecond. How does that all happen? Through an incredible communications network. And that communications network has been built out over the course of the last 20 years to add fiber to it. And because of that, we have the largest smart grid demonstration project in the country. Uh, because folks looked around after the economic stimulus bill and there was going to be an investment in smart grid demonstration efforts and they looked around and said, you know, the Northwest is better poised to be able to address that than any place else in the country. And so we have a bunch of new technologies that are being tried out here, including ways to be able to integrate wind by using the consumer side of the meter. And this is where the industry is going, is that it won't just be the utility controlling loads and resources, it will be on the, your side of the meter where there's the opportunity for you to make a contribution to help uh, the system at times that it needs it to reduce demand when peak is high and to uh, when the wind is blowing to be able to increase loads and when the wind is not blowing to decrease loads. 
uh, through your water heaters, through space heat, through a variety of different mechanisms. Again, this incredible communication system will create a leg up for us in terms of building that future. Now remember that other thing that Roosevelt said that I'm sure that back then in the 1930s nobody believed and the system will pay for itself? How many infrastructure investment programs actually pay for themselves? This is one that has. Uh, the original investments in Bonneville and Grand Coulee have been repaid with interest to the federal treasury. And in fact, we continue to make those payments. For the 29th straight year, just last October 1st, we made an $800 million payment to the U.S. Treasury, assuring that in fact this system will continue to be paid for by Northwest Electric Bay payers because we are the ones receiving the benefits from it. Okay, I'd like to take you on a little tour. the fastest tour of the Pacific Northwest you will ever take. 31 federal hydroelectric projects that again are yours. What we've wanted to share with you today is a little bit of the history of this one-of-a-kind system and how it's been developed primarily for your benefit, for the people of the Pacific Northwest. This is a system that has been developed as a public system, one that is owned by you. Those of us who work on the system are stewards of the assets on your behalf. Together we've been able to build an incredibly valuable system system that is the envy of the rest of the world in terms of both its economic and environmental value. But it'll be up to you, as the owners of the system, to decide how it will best be used. More than any place else in the world, we in the Northwest have the opportunity to address one of the great challenges of our generation, to bring down the barriers that separate economic success from ecological health and unite them in common purpose. We have that opportunity because of the Columbia River. Roll on, Columbia. Roll on.